May the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Amen. My heart is very full this morning, and I hope yours is also. And as I have been thinking about this text and working it over in my heart, I think of all the stories of yours that I know, and all of those stories that I don't know, and I think of how well this text may speak to you this morning, and it is my prayer that it does so. My name is Micah Smith, and I'm one of the past pastors here. What is going on over here? There's like a little trail of ants just kind of <laughs> running across there. And look at it, they're just going as fast as they can this way, and then they grab something from around the corner over there, and then they're going back as fast as they can the other way. We should probably tell Harv and Ed. <laughs> Do you ever kind of feel like maybe you're an ant when it comes to work? The, the ant is a metaphor for work in our lives sometimes. Maybe you feel that way, or, or maybe you feel more like you have a thin layer of dirt and there's pebbles and seeds there, and you're kind of scratching at that, trying to pick out what you need from it. And every, like, Do you feel sometimes like a chicken scratching at the dirt? Does that work in your life? What other animal metaphors are there for work? Is it the metaphor of the dog? You go as hard as you can, as fast as you can, and then you just, ah, I'm so tired, I worked hard. Maybe you feel like a walrus, you know? I have no idea what a walrus is like for work, but you can imagine some days you wake up in the morning, you're like, I don't want to get up, I don't want to move. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Pretty sure that's the walrus metaphor for work. We're talking in this series about breaking busy. Last week, Stafford led us through the opening of the series and he brought to, uh, to our attention our identity. Who are we in God? That we are those who have been made in his images. We have been called as rulers, as stewards of creation. This is part of our core identity, and it needs to be held in tension with how we live in this world so that we can indeed break busy. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about Sabbath, and we'll be talking about rest then. And I know when we heard the title, Breaking Busy, all of us wants to get really quickly to rest, but we can't go there yet. Today we need to talk about work. We're going to talk about work and how breaking busy comes from correctly defining work, our first movement this morning, and then our second movement is going to be defining vocation. I'll explain what that word means and how that helps us to break the power of busy. And then thirdly, we're going to talk this morning about defining brokenness and how defining brokenness helps us to break busy. Let me pray, and then we'll enter into the text this morning. Father God Almighty, as we come before you this morning, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit and through your word, that you would illumine our minds rekindle our hearts, and strengthen our wills. In your name we pray this. Amen. So we have three movements this morning, and I'm going to read three separate texts, one for each of the three movements. And normally I don't footnote my sermons. All of my sermons are very much a building up of the things that I have read. I read widely, and I have many conversations, and all these things influence the way and the things that I preach about. But every once in a while, a sermon is more built upon one person's work. And so I'd like to, every once in a while, just credit that person. And so today, as I talk about vocation and work, I'm building off of the work of Gordon Smith. Uh, he's one of our good alliance boys who works at the uh, university that is connected to, the, to our denomination. So let us turn this morning. We're going to read from Proverbs chapter 31. Now, you've probably heard about this text before. You've probably read it before, and maybe you see this text as an appendix to Proverbs. This is the text about a woman, and it's often seen as an appendix. Make sure you go out and find a good woman like this. However, I think there's a problem in reading that. Yes, it is a celebration of woman, of a woman who is a wife, but it's more than that. This text also tells us about work. And when we limit it only to women, we miss out on what the text is telling us about work and how work is done in and around the kingdom of God. So give ear as I read from this text this morning, and let us listen to what God is saying to us about work. 
I'm going to read from chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. A capable wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all of her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, and her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. Thus far, God's word. I think this text is often seen as an appendix to Proverbs, but it's more rightly seen as kind of a capstone. All of the wisdom of the book of Proverbs is embodied in what this woman, in the vision of this woman and her work. And as we come to breaking busy, it's important that we first define work. Because over the centuries, the Christian tradition has actually not done this very well. We have not always defined work in a fully biblical and theologically informed way. And so I'm turning to take a look at this text, Proverbs 31, but you can really look over the whole of the Bible and take out different places where it talks about work, and you can see the observations that I'm going to make today. But it's in this text, as the capstone of the book of Proverbs, where God teaches us what good work looks like. And so I'm going to look at six observations that this text shares with us. The first is home and the marketplace. Is there a higher calling between home and and the marketplace. I think so many of us think that the marketplace out in the world is where our higher calling is. And it's okay if I neglect some of the things at home. Maybe I neglect some of my responsibilities. Maybe the mundane, the ordinary, the things that are connected to my family or my neighbors or my community, that becomes less important if out in the marketplace is more important. But if we pay attention to this text, there's no differentiation there for her. She is caring for her household in the one moment, and the very next moment she turns around and she's buying and selling a field. The marketplace and the home are both good work. There is no difference between them in which one is more valuable to the kingdom of God. The second observation that I want to make, and each of these six observations are trying to correct, trying to adjust something in the way we think about work, And the second one is the difference between sacred work and secular work. I know so often for myself, I have felt this and I know this, that our Christian tradition has taught us that those who go out into the mission field are doing the really good work of the kingdom, whereas those who stay home, what they can do is they can actually give money to the actual, the real work of the kingdom. But in this text, it's very important to note that the celebration of work, the celebration of this woman, is around all the work that she does. And if you look through the witness of the whole Testament of Scripture, the good work that we are called to is all the good work, whether it's in arts and building the creations of of beauty that we love to see, whether it's in architecture, whether it's in business, whether it's in teaching. These are all good works. They are not just there to 
support the evangelistic enterprise. The whole work of God is summed up, is, is spoken into our lives in that all of the work that we do, secular or sacred, is holy and sacred. And then the, the next one I want to draw our attention to is the, the tension between head and hand. Another thing that our world, but even our Christian tradition has taught us, is that those who work with their minds are more valuable than those who work with our hands. And if you're really good, and if you're really successful, you will be promoted out of working with your hands on the actual stuff, and you will become somebody who works with their mind, who thinks of the big ideas, while other people actually do the work with their hands. And that the work of the mind is more important than the work of the hand. But notice in this text here, this woman who is running a whole enterprise is also working with her hands. Verse 13 tells us about how her, she works with willing hands. And then the next couple of verses speak to us about how she works with her hands at the loom and she reaches out her hands to the poor. We cannot move in this world with a biblically informed understanding of work if we think that head work is more valuable than hand work. The Christian tradition has often thought of Jesus as a carpenter, someone who works with his hands, and St. Paul as a tent maker, a man who worked with his hands. This is also holy work unto which we have been called. The third one I want to draw our attention to is the, the idea of a higher calling between paid work and volunteer work. I think so often in our world we have the tendency to think that the more that you are paid, and the more responsibility you have that that salary commands. Therefore, the more valuable your work is. As we read through this text, it's so easy to start to wonder, where is her husband in all of this? What is he doing? It says he's at the city gates. Is he just loafing there, hanging out with his buddies? No, the text tells us he is sitting at the city gates with the elders. And what that means is you're sitting in the city gates where all the people would congregate, where all the people would have to pass through. And as one of the elders of the community, you would sit there and debate civic matters. You would adjudicate between different claims, perhaps. You would help to orchestrate the, and govern the way the community is run. So he's doing that, and most likely it's not a paid position. This is something in which he would receive no salary for. So her work also supports his work as a volunteer. And I think we should be very careful, especially in our lives, when we start to think that the paid work is more important than our volunteer work. Of course, God does not keep a scorecard based on how much you make, but rather how faithfully you follow him, whether that's as a volunteer or through paid labor. The fourth one I want, fifth one I want to draw our attention to is public and private. Is there a higher calling the more fame you have, the more followers you have? It's so easy, even in the Christian tradition where we know this isn't true, but we think that the more followers you have, the more influence you have, therefore the greater the calling on your life. And those of you, us who work in private, who work behind the scenes in obscurity and anonymity, you are there to support them, that's very nice, but they're the really important ones. This text shows us through her life, through her work, through the work of this woman, that she does so much work behind the scenes. She does so much work behind the scenes, and this is the woman to be celebrated, the one who can work in anonymity and in obscurity. All of us are called to work, to more or less public and private dimensions of our lives, but we need to be men and women who work with integrity even when nobody is watching, even when the only scorecard that matters is the one that God is keeping. We work in anonymity and in private, and we are called to that life and to that work just as much as we may be called to the public sphere. And then the last observation I want to make from this text is in our, in our lives, very similar to public and private, we think of the grand and the heroic as being more important than the mundane and the ordinary. But again, this text draws us through her life and the celebration of her work, and it's very much the mundane and the ordinary, the keeping of her house, the balancing of the books, the buying of a field. And it's not the grand and the heroic that necessarily brings in the kingdom, but often it's the mundane and the ordinary, where we are faithful with the little things to the least of these, 
This is where God says, that's my kingdom coming through. And you're like, but I just did the dishes. Yeah. Did you see it? The mundane and the ordinary are as important to our calling and to our work as the grand and the heroic. There was a pilot who landed a plane in the middle of a city because of malfunction in the plane. His name is Sully. Many of us know his name because he did something absolutely incredible under stress and was able to save many lives. But it's actually more important what he did and has done since, in which we never know his name. He flies day after day, hundreds of people through the air, and he does not crash the plane. It's the mundane and the ordinary. Where we, where we, he actually is anonymous to us, in which we should be praying and thanking God for him doing his work with incredible incredible integrity behind the scenes. What we do anonymously is often the ways and means in which we are actually fulfilling God's call on our life. So I hope that those six kind of pairings help us think well about work. Right thinking about work can help us to see the evils in this world, the temptations perhaps. But we need to take those and ask, well, what do we do with that? And so we move to our second movement of this sermon. We're going to break busy by defining vocation. And I need to define for you what that word means, the way I'm using it. The word vocation comes from voca, voc- vocal, to call, to speak. A vocation is a calling. And it's important that we begin by defining that word because something else is happening in our world that we need to pay attention to And by defining vocation, it'll help us to be free from the powers of this world that want to make us very busy. You see, the world has has seen something in the way that we work. The world has also seen that many people in this world are dissatisfied with their work. And so you've probably read or heard about finding your passion. You need to go out and find your passion, work in your passion, and that's where you'll find true happiness and success. And I find that we're at an incredible time in history because we're talking about this idea of finding your passion. And we're at a time in history in which we actually can do that. I mean, if you look back over the last 1,200 years, the idea of work was that you went into the career that you were given, whether it was by birth or by nature of you being a slave or some other form of being told where you work, that would be your career, that would be your life. But as the time has gone on, we come to an incredible time in our lives in which we're allowed to actually choose what our careers are. And 100 years ago, 50 years ago, you would kind of choose your career and then you would move in that career, move up the ladder. But within my lifetime even, we have come to an incredibly new context where we talk about moving careers, but we we will actually move laterally. You might change industries multiple times over the course of your life. We are starting to ask theological questions that are on the cutting edge because we're in a context that has never happened in this world before, where you can choose your career and then step from one career to the next. There's an incredible amount of freedom, of opportunity here. I don't think all of us feel that freedom, though, do we? There's not many of us that um, can say, yeah, I can do whatever I want, because many of us actually feel tied to our work. Many of us feel that there's a lack of opportunities, that there's absolutely no flexibility in what we're in. Maybe you're in a job that you hate with nowhere to go and no alternative. Or maybe you don't have a job, or maybe you're in between work, or maybe you've actually never been part of the producing functional society. Or maybe, maybe just maybe, work sucks. I hear you. As I talk about the context, the incredible cutting edge that we're in, where we have this incredible freedom, we don't always feel it, do we? So I want to turn to our second text, John 14. And I want to read with you a few verses from John 14. Please hear these. Jesus says to us, verse 15 and following, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, 
because he abides with you and he will be in you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Jesus gives us peace in a way that the world does not give us peace. And he calls us and says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I wonder, I wonder if just maybe our society has got things a little bit messed up, if they've missed something when they talk about work and in particular the North American dream. When that dream, when that society promises us that you can do anything and be anything you want to be, when it sells us a bill of goods, a bill of goods that seems to say that if you work hard enough at your passion, you will be able to succeed financially and be independent. Now, there's some truth to it. We can work in the places and spaces of our passion. But it's kind of the truth that doesn't seem to go all the way down. And here's where I like to think of myself as Winnie the Pooh. Because Winnie the Pooh is one of my heroes. He has a pot of honey, and he goes out hunting heffalumps. But he wants to see if inside that honey, is it honey all the way down? Well, let's just test it and see. It's honey at the top. But I don't want the heffalump to get upset by finding it's not honey all the way down. So he, he keeps going. Anyways, my hero. <laughs> with something like this, with this, it seems like honey that you can do and be anything you want. I want us to go all the way down and to test it. Is this something indeed that is true all the way through? So as Christians, what kind of peace do we want and how do we get there? We need to do so with that biblically, theologically informed idea of work, as I talked about from Proverbs. But how do we participate in the life of Jesus? And you've probably heard me say something along these lines before, that the kingdom of God is not breaking in on Sunday morning, but it's breaking in on Monday morning. And so I want to talk about vocation, this idea of being called. Because on Monday morning, it matters what you do there is an expression, and it's the fruit of whether or not you experience God in your life today. The kingdom breaks in tomorrow by how you live your life. We need to think vocationally. Vocation, the idea of being called, regardless of whether you are paid or a volunteer, regardless of the season of life you're in, whether you're the 22-year-old who's just beginning to find out who am I and what kind of work is there in this world, or whether you're on the other end of things and you're wondering, well, I've finished my work in the world, now what do I do? Vocation is something that is given to you and it matters to you regardless of whether or not you have a career. You can lose your career, but you cannot lose your vocation. You have been called. Some vocations take longer to ripen. Some vocations bloom like flowers all through the time and then they go through a period with no flowers. So there are different ways of being called and those different callings will bloom in season appropriately for that calling. I like to think of one of the... I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and one of them is the professional sports player. What is their vocation, and to what are they called? I think it's no surprise that so many sports professional players feel a, a calling, a vocation, to minister to young people, particularly those who don't have mentors, who don't have someone in their life helping them along the way to make sense of the world and to succeed and thrive in this life. So often professional sports players, yes, they love their job, if you will, but they sense that there's a deeper calling that they're called to, and it's to be a mentor or to help mentorship happen. You can have a vocation and a calling that is independent of your career, but your career allows you the platform from which to do it. And I think of how professional sports players have been gifted and talented, and how their gifting and their talent will intersect as a platform and as a way for them to fulfill their vocation to which they have been called. Some vocations take longer, as I said, to fulfill, and I think of my mother in this regard. She grew up, I grew up, with her as the homemaker in our house. And at that time, I didn't see it, and it took me a long time, probably until now, to really see what is the calling on my mother's life. She's called to be an encourager, to be someone who lends courage to other people, who gives them strength and a sense of 
of peace. And she does this primarily through art and design. She's an interior decorator who likes to care about the spaces that many of us just kind of brush past. She will put plants in an atrium to make sure that we are all encouraged as we move through that space. And it's only as I've seen her in the older years, as I have been outside of the house looking back at her life and seeing how she is now, that I begin to see her encouragement vocation is beginning to ripen and to bloom in ways that it didn't before. Similarly for my dad, a great speaker and a teacher. But over the years, he found that this isn't his actual vocation. As good as he is at it, his vocation was actually administration, was actually leadership and governance, and this is where he was called to work. That takes a good amount of time to ripen into leadership and administration. Some vocations take longer, others take less time to ripen. But what, what does thinking vocationally give to us, and how does it break busy? It's primarily around the simple meaning of the word vocation, meaning to be called. What or who calls you? Well, if it's the creator and the redeemer of the world who calls you into vocation, into work in this world, then it matters because what it does is it sets you free. It sets you free of comparing yourself to other people. Because if God calls me to live and work in the world this way, and he calls the other person to live in the world and work that way, I can celebrate them because that is the way God has called them. And I don't have to compare myself to them and think of myself as better or lesser, just simply that is the way that God has called them. And it also sets me free to think vocationally because it sets me free of the urgency, the tyranny of time. Because it doesn't matter so much. Do I have enough time to climb the ladder high enough? to really get the power? No, I, need, I can live in where God has called me. I can live with the vocation God has called me. I mean, he knows where I am. He will come and get me if he needs me. He has called me to a vocation, and I will live at peace in that vocation to which he has called me, regardless of how much time it seems that I have. Because ultimately, it's up to him, not me. And then also, thinking vocationally, recognizing that I have been called, it also frees me from artificial standards of excellence. When we look around our world, we see the level, the bar that has been raised at which we're all supposed to operate. But that doesn't matter if I've been called by God. I don't have to meet that standard of excellence. Oh, excellence, I believe in. Oh, yes, for sure. But I only have to meet the excellence that matters between myself and God. He's the one who has given me the gifts and the talents he sees the limits, the context in which I live, and it's the excellence that I'm able to do in and with the ways and means that he has called me that matter to him. I don't have to please everyone. I'm now free from pleasing everyone else. I only have to perform. I only have to live for an audience of one. Thinking vocationally helps us to break ourselves free from the busyness, the power of busy in our lives. And then our third movement, from Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and 36. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? We break busy, and we break away from busy. We are broken from busy by defining brokenness. Take up your cross and follow me. And I think if I, this isn't the kind of text that I think I can actually preach on as well as I would like to take up your cross. What I would long for would be, especially thinking vocationally, would be to sit down with each one of you over coffee. You know, if there's a couple of people in the back there who could just grab me a chair and, and a table maybe. I would love to take each of you out for coffee, and I'm buying because, of course, you're going to be doing most of the talking. We break busy, and we're broken free from busy by getting at what really matters. A man by the name of, of Peter Block 
has identified that we are overly attracted to the pragmatic. We're overly attracted to what works, what's effective. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> That's perfect. What we care about is getting tangible, measurable results and getting them quickly. And then once you get on that train, let's get results. You start to want to get it again. Let's get results. Let's get results. Let's get results. Let's get results. And you just want to keep moving. It feels like an adrenaline high. You've really got it going. But as we get caught up in the train of effectiveness, of the train of pragmatism, what starts to happen is that we, we are distracted from what really matters. And so we might be exhausted because we're not doing our true work. We're doing work. But we're not doing the work that connects to who we truly are and where our powers truly are, have been given to us. And so I'd love to sit down for coffee with you. And I think if our, if our lives have been defined by the questions that we'd ask, I'd like to try to work with you to hear the questions in your life. And this is how we would be able to hear the call of God on your life. The question I want to ask is, where do you see the brokenness in this world? Where in the space and time that you live and have been granted to live, where do you see brokenness? Where do you feel the fragmentation of this world? And as our conversation progresses, I'd want to give you some examples. Do you see the brokenness in the young people, in the young adults of our world? the temptations of drugs or the lack of opportunities that they might face or the dangers of gangs, maybe the ambivalence of an adolescent. Do you feel the call to act there? Well, I know that Portage would be blessed if you were to hear God's call in this regard. Portage and beyond. Perhaps in your life you hear and you feel and sense the brokenness of the downtrodden, those who have no home. Is it housing where you feel suffering? The brokenness of our economy that makes housing and home so hard and elusive to so many. Is that where you see the brokenness of this world? Where you feel the fragmentation of other people? If you are called into this space, you will be a blessing to Portage and beyond. Surely you see the messed up politics of our time as well. But maybe you, maybe it's you who are called into this space. Well, oh, then I will pray for you. May the armor of God protect you and protect you as you serve. Their portage needs you and beyond. Where do you see? Where do you feel the brokenness of this world? Because Jesus has called you, he has given you the desires of your heart, and he has imprinted upon you the very feelings that connect with this world as he connects with this world. You see, he saw how great this world was broken and suffering. He took up his cross, he denied himself, and he followed the call that was placed on his life. Similarly, he invites you into his calling and into his work, that you would be light and life to all people, participating in the redemption of this world through acts of justice and compassion. And he has gifted you. And the place where your gifting and your talent meets the place where you see and feel the brokenness of this life, this is the place in which you will find the greatest and deepest fulfillment because you are following after the one who calls you, the one who made you, and the one who works in and through you because he, by his spirit, is in you and with you. Thanks be to God, who has made for us good work and calls, it, calls us to it. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on out and to lead us through this final song as we continue to hear from our Lord Jesus Christ, who has called us here this morning to work with him.